we, we are still preparing uh, f some technology up here and getting ready but it's it's very close to time to start the meeting and we have a, a little trailer here this morning of our uh, San Angelo video and so uh, Mr. Wilson if you'd like to, he's a public information officer you can kick that off and then we'll continue to get ready up thank here. You, thank you thank you mayor and city council members uh, this is the world premiere, I guess you could say, of a video that uh, has been in the works, at least in Brian Groves' mind, for a very long time. And so I really give a lot of credit to him for for spearheading this. This is something he has wanted to do. And uh, with a little uh, push from Councilman uh, Alexander, uh, we drafted a script and got a lot of uh, participation from some of our partners within the community. And, and the Chamber of Commerce has enthusiastically endorsed this. We hope that you like it too, but if you have some suggestions for us, Please let us know, and with, uh, without any further ado, we'll, we'll get this started. I may need to get Brian up here because this is not restarting the way we had hoped it would. Yeah. We're good. The convergence of three rivers and the vastness of the western prairie of Texas marks a place nature itself set aside as a beacon unto the frontier. San Angelo rose here in 1867 beside the U.S. Cavalry outpost Fort Concho. The soldier station here served as a long arm of the law for the vast Texas plains. More than 145 years later, San Angelo reaches into the future frontiers, encompassing the state, the nation, even the globe. Today, San Angelo is setting standards in fields such as education, the arts, quality living, and as it was in the beginning, defense. Goodfellow Air Force Base trains more than 11,000 students a year from all four military branches in the missions of firefighting, intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance. The community's resolute support of our base and welcoming attitude towards the personnel stationed there has swayed the nation's political and military leaders to continue to fund Goodfellow's growth, even as other installations were downsized or shuttered. Angelo State University has earned recognition for offering a top quality but affordable university experience with strengths in teacher education, agriculture, nursing, physics, biology, and security studies. In 2007, Angelo State joined the Texas Tech University System. Enrollment has since steadily marched toward a goal of 10,000 students. On the fields of play, the ASU Rams and Ram Bells compete at championship levels in baseball, softball, volleyball, track and field. San Angelo still serves as a regional hub for commerce in all forms, banking, energy, agriculture, health care, retail and entertainment. The city maintains a healthy manufacturing presence in industries such as medical products and metal fabrication. The San Angelo Stock Show and Rodeo is our community's signature event. The Wild West Spectacle offers one of the five most lucrative prize purses on the professional rodeo tour. At the same time, the San Angelo Stock Show features thousands of exhibitors from virtually every one of the 254 counties in Texas competing in more than 40 events. From the first indigenous people here, whose legacy can be viewed still on painted rocks, to the modern day, artists have always been able to find their muse here. The arts are a thriving local passion. The distinctively shaped San Angelo Museum of Fine Arts continually showcases a fascinating array of eye-catching exhibits. The art museum's elegance is perfectly complemented by the Old Chicken Farm Art Center. 
a commune of artisans who create in quaint studios on the grounds of, you guessed it, an old chicken farm. San Angelo also embraces a renowned symphonic orchestra and ballet company, several youth theater troops, and the state's oldest community theater. The recent renovation of our historic city hall is enhancing the ongoing revitalization of our historic downtown that once again pulses with brio, not to mention shopping. Then as the sun sets, downtown visitors can find live music ranging from the bluest rhythms to the most raucous rock in one of the central business district's many night spots. Water remains a magnetic attraction. Lake Nath is where these constant level lures boaters, wakeboarders, anglers, and campers from across West Texas. Nasworthy is also one of the most popular stops on the Lucas Oil Drag boat racing series. In contrast to speedboats, skimming across the water at more than 250 miles per hour, the Tranquil International Water Lily Collection is a one-of-a-kind assortment of rare and beautiful water lilies. It's also the birthplace of the Texas Dawn, the official water lily of the state of Texas. Along the Concho River, millions of dollars are being invested to transform San Angelo's River Walk into a must-be destination for those who favor scenic vistas, public artwork, exercise, and leisure. Fort Concho still stands watch. Today, a national historic landmark, the fort is the city's top tourist attraction. Its 40 acres boast 23 restored structures and a lively history program populated by Buffalo soldiers, cavalry, infantry, and a colorful cast of gunslingers, brothel girls, and lawmen. The annual Christmas at Old Fort Concho celebration has become a holiday staple. And also as it was in 1867, the Concho's general flow remains a steadfast symbol for what San Angelo has always been and is today an oasis, a fertile haven that's a perfect place to work, to play, to call home. You guys may have recognized the uh, voice of San Angelo Stadium, Sonny Clear, narrating that for us, and we really appreciate his working with us on that. And with that, uh, again, we're hoping to use this to help promote our community, uh, along with our partners, the Chamber, the CVB, the uh, Economic Development Corporation. So if you have any suggestions uh, regarding the video, please uh, feel free to uh, email those to me. Appreciate it. Very good. Thank you. Do you see her? I don't see her. Hmm. Do you want to take the prayer today, Morrison? Yeah, yeah I, I, I took it last time I let you. Okay. <coughs> Good morning. Let me call the meeting to order, and uh, we will start the, the meeting with prayer and pledge, but we're a little, I guess the beginning of the new year, we're a little... Uh, out of out of sync uh, to start off we don't have anyone helping with the pledge and we don't have anyone helping with the prayer uh, folks not being here so mr. Morrison how about starting us off with a prayer and then I'll start us on the pledges okay yes, sir. let us pray our dear Heavenly Father we thank you so very much for all the many wonderful things that you have done for us we thank you for the opportunities we thank you for this another beautiful day and we thank you for the rain that we are enjoying we thank you for the rain that you have sent, Father, but as always, we plead for more to fill our lakes, our streams, and our reservoirs so that the balance of nature might once again re be returned to this beautiful area. We thank you for our city, Father. We thank you for all of the people that make it up. We thank you for the diversity that we have, and we are very thankful to you for all the many wonderful things you have done. We ask that you be with us today as a city council to give us the wisdom that we need to make the decisions that are right to give us the patience to listen to the people that come before us and give us the courage to make the decisions as they need to be made. would ask that you be with us, that you love us, you forgive us, and you be with us. This we ask in the name of Jesus. Amen. <laughs> 
Amen. Amen. have one special recognition uh, this morning and so I'd uh, like to be joined by Mr. Anderson. I, there you go. I didn't know if it was going to be, if there was more than one or not this morning. How are you, sir? Good. We have a special recognition this morning honoring Mr. Anderson and his business and so whereas during the 16th annual Texas Workforce Conference Employer Recognition Luncheon held at the Gaylord Texan November 29th, 2012, the Texas Workforce Commission named Western Towers an Employer of Excellence. And whereas Western Towers partnered with Workforce Solutions for the Concho Valley for the staffing and developing its new Harriet Manufacturing Facility and the new plant helped Western Towers become the premier positive train control tower manufacturer, supplying towers to most American and all Canadian railroads. And whereas, honoring its commitment to our country's veterans, Western Towers raised the percentage of veteran employment to 20% and additional disabled veterans may be hired during future expansion. And whereas Western Towers' new plant is equipped with a state-of-the-art rainwater recovery system, which operates the entire plant from normal rainfall, and whereas Western Towers implemented a productivity bonus system in the new facility, which has resulted in phenomenal fabrication production, placing it on pace to greatly increase its annual payroll over the next three years. Now, therefore, it is with great pleasure that I, Alvin New, Mayor of the City of San Angelo, on behalf of the City Council, do hereby recognize and apply applaud Western Towers for their tireless commitment to excellence in business and supporting community throughout the city of San Angelo. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you very much. Charles, do you want I do thank uh, the city for this recognition of our company and all the people that uh, made it possible. And I uh, really uh, appreciate our city. Uh, my family first came here in 18, uh, I guess 1867. And uh, we have uh, tried to help San Angelo grow. And thank you all very much. Next item is public comment. The council takes public comment on all items in the regular agenda. Public input on a regular agenda item will be taken at its appropriate discussion. Public input on an item not on the agenda or consent agenda may be identified and requested for consideration by the council at this time. <coughs> the council may request an item to be placed on a future agenda or for a consent agenda item to be moved to the regular agenda for public comment. Um, Number council? three. Number three. Okay, so I have a, a desire to move item number three, and then I have a desire to table, I believe it's item number 15. Is that correct? Yes, sir, that's correct. Okay, I'd like to table item number 15 and, and, 
and go ahead and bring it up at the next council agenda at the next meeting that uh, having spoken with the players there and and with staff uh, mr. El Gathabo is not available today and uh, is the director at the airport and would be the one answering any questions and so without him here it seems like the right thing to do is to let that wait and uh, and cover it Thank at the you. next meeting okay okay <coughs> I'd like uh, to make a motion to approve the consent agenda uh, with the exception of item number three and also make a motion to table item number 15 to uh, for a later meeting second okay I have a motion and a second uh, and call for that vote then all those in favor please say aye. aye aye any opposed okay at this time I'd like to open up for public comment and uh, comments from anyone on council uh, and then uh, comments from the public so does anyone have anything uh, any public public comments not related to the agenda this morning please come on up <coughs> First of all, I want to thank you, and uh, isn't it great that we live in a country where we can meet with our leaders and explain our wishes sometimes uh, to the community as to uh, our abilities to help and aid the city. First of all, I'd like to note that uh, I'm a property owner. Keep going with it. Please go ahead and establish your name for the record. For okay. Me. okay. My name is Bill Murray. Thank you, sir. I own property in front of the Coliseum, approximately, I guess, three quarters or better of the block just south of the Coliseum. And uh, I have noticed in the last six months after 1979, meeting with the city, that this was zoned supposedly by our plat to be commercial. When, when I went before the permit office, I found out that there's a small corner of my property that is residential. And to the right of that, of course, I own both sides. They told me there was a master plan that keeps the zoning as such. And I'd like to meet with the city commission and tell me why I'm paying commercial rates and taxes when I've got uh, about 75 feet of my property I can't use legally, but I've been doing it for 30 some odd years, I have to admit. But now I bought a 4.9 acre track right behind me, which uh, gives me the ability uh, to, I think, to speak out that I would like to have that master plan with your consent to give me that other, <laughs> just to my boundary, in one one swipe, either commercial or residential, and I've been using it for 30 something, uh, 30 something years as commercial, paying that rate. Uh, so I'd like to meet with y'all and get your minds together and show you, it's, 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 it's terrible. <laughs> I'm, I'm processing uh, the land behind that, the five acres now, uh, I'm redoing a, a home that uh, needed to be reconstructed in North Angelo. Uh, it's a, a blessing to, to do that because it's an improvement. But I want that zone looked at with your permission and Grace just to tell me why it's that way and can't be changed. I don't, I don't understand that when I own I own all of it. There's no one behind me, in front of me, or beside me, other than Coliseum Drive and four houses. And the line, what makes the difference within 300 feet going this way is all commercial. And then you take the next 50 feet over 75 feet, and it's residential. I'd like to address that in future. And also uh, underground burial pipeline gas under that that the city does not even have recorded. Okay, sir. Thank you. You bet. Thank you very much for speaking to us. Mr. Murray. But Mr. Murray. Just for my information, which part of that property is the residential? Is it on 43rd or is it on Chadburn? It's 42nd. 42nd. 
Okay, it's the corner there. Uh, not the corner. It, if you take a plat and you take a pie shape, take the north end to seven, uh, uh, about 17 feet, and then over about 28 feet at the very offset, that is residential. But then I have three other lots <laughs> that are spaced there that was zoned in 1979 as special manufactured housing lots that are permanent. I want to remind you that, permanent. So I own all of it. There's just, uh, just a small portion of that. Now I bought the W.J. Jennings property, which mm -hmm. is five acres in there on the same city block. And that little half moon that goes around like so is also residential. So it, it, the property line is like a big Z, and the Coliseum sits right in front of it. Okay. It's a no-brainer. Uh, but I really would like I to see that corrected, and I, I think brought it to your attention. Fixed. I brought it to your attention several times. And uh, anyway, I appreciate y'all. Don't get me wrong. <laughs> I just w I'd like to have that corrected. Thanks very much. Uh, Mr. Morrison, I'm aware now, just now, that he has spoken uh, with some folks, so probably the best way to move forward is for you and Mr. Valenzuela to get your heads together and kind of decide where to go next. Okay. You know, we had this same problem at Western Towers. We had a property that was all one, and then one little old bitty section was something else, and we had to change that. So it, it just, there's this the procedure we're going to have to go through, but we can fix it. Anyway. I'll work on it, sir. Okay, let's start. <clears throat> Is there any other public comment? Okay, outstanding. Let's start with item number three off the consent agenda and, uh, and start the regular session. This is consideration of authorizing the city manager to execute a change order of up to $400,000 uh, concerning Archer Western Construction, and it's related to the Hickory Booster Pump Station. And so I think looking for explanation, Mr. Dixon. <coughs> Good morning, Council. City Manager, <coughs> the change order for your consideration this morning is for the possibility of doing some advanced brush clearing in preparation for the expansion of the new wells on the Hickory. Uh, right now we're, we're working with the Texas Water Development Board to try to get this accomplished. As you may or may not know, we have a restriction out there on that property dealing with the black cap vario in their mating and nesting season, which runs from March 15th to September the 15th. And this change order uh, could possibly allow us to go ahead and do the brush clearing necessary for the expansion of the new west well field before we get to that March 15th time frame. When we get to that from March 15th to September 15th, there's, it, it's not going to happen. <coughs> if we wait for um, the regular approval process from the Texas Water Development Board, um, that's going to take, we estimate, 60 days, and that will put us into that time frame anyway. So basically what we're trying to do <coughs> is just use this option if we can get all the necessary approvals beforehand to try to get this done. We also have the problems out there that we're not sure of yet, and all of these things, there's, there's just lots of things to consider when we're talking about this, and that's why we want this option if we can make it work. We're not real sure yet um, if we do all the necessary monitoring that we can even drill wells during this March 15th to September 15th time frame. So that's another issue that we're, we're trying to work out. If we do the necessary noise monitoring and there's no active nests disturbed during this time frame, then there's a possibility that they will let us drill during this time frame. Another issue that we're trying to resolve is the Ford Ranch itself where these wells are located has restrictions during hunting season. That's usually typically November, December time frame. So we've got all these things that's working against us out here on this well field and we're trying to get all these things 
worked into. If we don't get the brush cleared now, we have to wait till September the 15th to do it. They're looking at a month and a half to two months to get this done. So, you know, it, everything's running pretty tight. If we have to wait till September, that gets us into the, the hunting season. It's, it's, so anyway, that's all this is about. I wanted y'all to consider it, to let us do this, if we can get everything done, to get this brush clearing done. We've got about a little over seven miles of area to clear, grub, and grind prior to getting the whales dripped. My can, concern. Okay, My let's uh, let me <laughs> let's let's establish a little ground rule <coughs> today. Okay, we're we're reaching a point where we're speaking over each other consistently, and so I'm I'm uh, I'm not going to acknowledge you if you start speaking, and I'm going to cut you off uh, if you don't look at me and get my attention first. So we're just not going to do that today. Okay. So yeah, I look at you and get your attention first. Atta boy, <laughs> have at it, <laughs> Mr. Adams. Okay. Um, Ricky, you answered the question that I had in reference to the to the uh, time constraints. When I was looking through the material, I noticed that it said uh, that um, the <coughs> Texas Water Development Board may not fund this this uh, this project. And then, so my question <coughs> was, does that mean that there's a possibility that they will? But I think you addressed that pretty good. There, there is a possibility that we could get reimbursement. Next question. After okay. the fact. Okay. But. If they allow us to do this without their complete review process, we're going to have to fund it initially. And it may be that they do not reimburse us. So that needs to be considered. So we got a 50-50 chance. That's best okay. case. Okay, and I understand that the, uh, the uh, change order is for additional work necessary for uh, the field expansion, um, I get, which leads me to my next point. Why wasn't it in the original contract? Did I when miss? Did for was it? It was. I'm sorry. It, as I recall, it was mentioned at the time by Mr. Wilde when they presented it that there may need to be a change order that the brush removal could not be funded in advance by the project. Uh, the city would have to pay for it and then be reimbursed. It was talked about in uh, advance. I think we need to clarify that. Uh, that <coughs> it's that. Let, let's first clarify the, the Water Development Board money. It's not free money. It's correct. a loan. Yes. That's correct. That's yeah. all it is. That's correct. It's, it's simply a low-interest loan. So we're going to pay the money anyway. Okay, so I kind of lay in that groundwork out anyway. So it's a question of whether we're going to pay for it out of our checkbook today or whether we're going to pay for it in the long run over a note. Correct. Correct. Okay. All right. Get that that clarified. Um, so to me, it, it, it provided it's not ten million dollars. It's simply a cash flow issue is a question. Okay. The second thing I, I've got to say is, to, to me, in my eyes, because I've okay, been keeping on. a very close eye. Mr. Herschel, just a second. What you're doing first is answering his question. I want to make sure he's through, and then sure. I'll acknowledge you. Yeah, sure. I'm, I'm good. All right, Thank Mr. Herschel. Okay. Um, the, the the second part is. I've been wa monitoring and watching this project very closely, um, and this well field expansion, I mean, that was, this is not necessarily, this was not part of the original Hickory well field drilling. This is part of the well field expansion that we approved in July, I believe, I believe it was in July. So this is part of the normal course of business. Typically, I would say that you would come to us and say, we've sent it out for a bid. It's going to be $2.5 million to drill all these wells, and I hope it's 2.5. <laughs> Good luck. And, but it, it, and to do the, the clearing and to do the, this and this, and they'll have an entire scope. Uh, on the scope of this project, this is, this is absolutely vital. This is vital to us for our long-term water that this happen sooner rather than later and uh, provided again it's not a cash flow horrible burden on us i am highly supportive of us doing this and in the estimation on drilling these these five new proposed wells is somewhere around a 20-month time frame Correct. so any delays is just going to push that out further and further and further and further okay mr valenzuela uh, 
Yes, I also want to point out, of course, uh, the original was for six million gallons a day, uh, and really what we want to do is, is get us up to the nine million gallons a day. Those are additional wells in the future, of course, will serve not just uh, for the additional water that will be coming in, but also as a redundancy system. Um, the initial six million if there's an issue there so uh, it's getting started now it's vital to us I definitely do agree with that and hopefully we can move forward with this <coughs> Mr. Hirschfeld is that a motion motion to approve second I think I heard Mr. Adams uh, <laughs> so I have a motion to approve from Mr. Hirschfeld a second from Mr. Adams Do I have further uh, council input on this I Adam? have a question Mr. Silvas yes, Ricky you when you talk about the you, you're not sure whether you can drill do any drilling are you talking about the proposed the new wells you can right, the other wells are drilled this is for the expansion of the well but you, you don't know whether you can drill on in these yet is it that's correct and why why is that Time, timing being the main question right and the restrictions dealing with the black cap vario area if the necessary steps are taken they have been successful in the past in doing this but I can't stand here today and say yeah it's a done deal I can't guarantee that we've still got to get everybody's approval but one day we would drill these yes it's just a matter and, and the problem you get into Johnny you're not going to find a drilling company that wants to come in for two months and punch a hole and okay we can't work for six months and then just let that rig sit there the costs are going to be astronomical so that's the that's the situation we're facing. That's all Mr. I have. Alexander. So in just layman's terms, repeat to me, we can clear this land. Do you, is that something we, we can do that? We well, can pay for this on, uh, on our own and clear this land before March 15th. Yet, yes, for sure, not maybe, probably. Probably. Okay. That's as far as I'm going. And then I'm going to reiterate what uh, Kendall said. This, this is vital. And then I'm going to say what this means to the people. If, if our lakes run out of water and we don't have water, we can rely on the hickory. Right now, it will only supply 71% of our indoor needs. And so if we delay this, there's this window when we have to use less water just indoors, let alone the plants outdoors. And so this increase will help us all our indoor use for four or five years, like five years, plus a little outdoor use. So it's a big difference. Uh, quality of life, big giant difference. And so. Uh, I mean, we're, looking, we're getting very close here. If we don't get a lot of rain, uh, we'll be cutting very close. If you delay it, then we have this window that's a problem. Right. Okay. Mr. So Morrison? Assure me that this hickory water is going to sustain 9 million gallons a day pumping. Because if we start pumping this aquifer that is a very slow recharge and this aquifer drops, they're going to cut us off. So assure me that if we punch these additional holes, and we pull this additional water, there's enough water for us to pull. I don't know that I can assure you that, Dwayne. I mean, that's what we're, that's what everybody says, but I'm not gonna stand here and say, yeah, it's, I guarantee it. That's what concerns me because San Saba County and Mason County and McCulloch County, uh, Concho County all pull out of this exact same aquifer. With the, with the amount of water that we have banked there now if we get into a nine million a, a gallon a day draw for of this we won't be pulling it very long anyway because we're going to run out of banked water it, five years five years that's a long time to me it's a long time. okay so i'm i'm gonna gonna weigh in on some of the knowledge then on this to mr dixon the hydrogeologists all say that there's some 40 or 50 years worth of water with the planned projected use by San Angelo and all of the other users that are, that are tied into that uh, aquifer. So I'll start with that. The second thing I'm going to say is what you said is absolutely correct. <clears throat> the only way that we want to start using this water and the additional wells before the year 2024 is because we have to have That's it. Correct. On the other hand, it does build in redundancy. If something happens to the processes with the first six million gallons, the wells that currently exist, putting these wells in place would allow us to go ahead and keep pumping water to the six million gallon level 
because there's something wrong with the original well or the booster station or something that might allow this might allow us to carry on uh, during that time frame and it could allow us during an absolute emergency to use water now that we actually don't want to use until the year 2024 right. that's basically the four years that mr alexander is talking about so so i you know i think that there there's no reason based on what hydrogeologists who are the guys that are paid to do this stuff say and have guided us and everyone else in the area to believe there's 40 or 50 years worth of water with the plan that's in place uh, so I see no reason why we wouldn't do this. I do think, as uh, Mr. Alexander said and as Mr. Hirschfeld said, if we don't go, uh, and as you have uh, instructed, if we don't go get that brush cleared, uh, given that you, and you said it, Mr. Dixon, given that you get necessary approvals, what you're doing today is lining up the money. That's correct. And then, then you got to keep lining things up. And if all that comes together, you're going to go get this done before the environmental impact is a it dissuades activity uh, or 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 disallows activity right. so i i can't see why we wouldn't move this process forward uh, under what's being asked for okay are there other inputs here is there public input on this item i have a motion and a second let me call for the vote all those in favor please say aye aye, aye. aye. any opposed okay thank you very much let's move on then to the regular agenda <coughs> this is item number eight. This is a first public hearing in consideration of introduction of an ordinance amending chapter 12, exhibit A. This is zoning case 12 18, uh, David Mazur related case, and a presentation today by our planning manager, A.J. Faber. Good morning. Good morning to all of you. Bear with me for just one moment, please. about that our first case for today um, is a can well that's not even the right case one more moment please there we go uh, is a zoning case that is twofold in that there are two applicants as you could see from your background report one of those applicants being Mr. Mazur one of those applicants being the uh, City of San Angelo Planning Commission we'll explain that in just a moment there were 18 notifications sent out on this request we received four in favor and zero in opposition I'll go through where those uh, notifications received were received from in just a moment as well to better orient you, we are looking at an area that is just north of the downtown area. Uh, it is adjacent immediately to North Chadburn Street and just south of the expressway, and here's a closer view of that. The area in black, the corner lot here, if you will, is the uh, property owned by Mr. Mazur, so that is Z1218. Uh, the remainder of this block face that is cross-hatched represents the properties that <coughs> fall under the case number Z1219 that was initiated by the City of San Angelo's Planning Commission. Here's an aerial photograph of these, this area. The uh, property in question owned by Mr. Mazur is a property um, that they're looking at doing some new redevelopment with. It was originally, you may remember, an industrial service type of business. Uh, about two years ago, the Planning Commission and city staff brought to the city council a discussion for expanding the central business district. And at that time, we had lengthy discussion about what would happen to this industrial service business if that property were rezoned. At that time, the council instructed us to essentially leave that block as it was so as not to inconvenience that property owner that had been currently in business. That business is no longer, and again, this property is looking at being redeveloped in a way that would fall into the parameters of the central business district. 
the remainder of this block face uh, you may be familiar with some of the businesses there the teacher store in particular most people are familiar yeah. with <laughs> it is full of businesses that also fall within the parameters of the central business district they all fall within our retail classification so everything that is in place today and everything that's proposed to be in place would fall within the parameters of today's proposal this is an excerpt from the vision plan map of the comprehensive plan for the city of San Angelo. It does call for a purple designation that stands for downtown and it's really aimed at looking at a mix of businesses and encouraging residential um, into some of the upper stories and sporadic businesses that may be vacant at this time. That also fits into the scheme of what the proponent is looking at doing. I'll go back for just a moment to talk about the notifications that we sent out and what we received. All of the areas in green denote properties that were in favor of this request. We also did, you might be interested to know, talk with downtown San Angelo. Mr. Morrison, I know you had asked us to do that in a previous case, so we did do that this time. They were also very much in support of the request, so we also have that to report for you. A few photographs of the area. This is looking east, uh, looking down East 3rd Street. This uh, center here, this property that's labeled the dojo in the photograph, is the uh, southernmost boundary of the properties that we're looking at. And then this is pulling back and looking down North Chadburn. So on the right-hand side of the screen, you'll see all of these businesses on this block face. Those are the subject of today's request. I can show you more photographs if you have specific questions, but I think that gives a fairly good overview of the request. Uh, planning staff does recommend approving it. It is consistent with all of our planning principles and documents that we have on file, and the Planning Commission also recommended a unanimous approval by a vote of five to zero at their December meeting. And if you have any questions on the request, either or, I can certainly answer those for you now. Mr. Mayor, I would like to go ahead and make a motion. Okay, so, sir. Second. To to uh, approve changing the zoning classification from general commercial, heavy commercial, to use the CB or the Central Business District. I would like to make that motion. Okay, thank you, Mr. Silvis. Mr. Hurstfield, you seconded? Yes. Okay, is there further discussion by council on this item? Okay, is there public input on this item? I'll call for the vote. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, item number nine. This is the first public hearing in consideration of introducing an ordinance amending Chapter 12, Exhibit A of the Code of Ordinances, City of San Angelo. <laughs> this is Zoning 12-17 related to CSA materials. Presentation by our Planning Manager, A.J. Favre. Thank you. On this particular request, there were 13 notifications required to be sent out by state law. We did receive uh, zero in opposition or in favor of the request. The property you might be somewhat familiar with, it is within the bounds of the property that you as a council annexed into the city limits in December of 2011. Uh, the property in question is shown on the map here. It encompasses property which falls along both sides of a projection of Smith Boulevard and just northwest of Porter Henderson Drive. If you were to pull out, you would actually see that this property here, this uh, street is known as Old Ballinger Highway. And then here at the front, we have uh, North Loop 306 as it turns into uh, Highway 277. This is an aerial photograph. This aerial does date back to 2011, but there hasn't been a great deal of change since that time. A lot of the property is vacant. There are a wide variety of industrial uses that were taking place in and around this area, both before the annexation date and since the annexation date. You might recall as well that is on this slide, we looked at the vision plan map in this area and set up this area as sort of an industrial hub for the northeast part of St. Angelo. So the request that the proponent has brought to us is in line with that plan and is in line with the industrial designation. I have a few photographs I'll flip through very quickly. They're not indicative of much other than the sparseness of development in this area. This is looking west directly at the subject property in the foreground. And then this is looking at the subject property from Porter Henderson Drive. It does illustrate some of the activity that is currently taking place on the site and was taking place before the annexation. Uh, therefore, it is still legally being carried on as it is legally non-conforming, but this zoning classification change would actually uh, allow this activity to take place in perpetuity. Here are some other photographs. This is looking east on Tractor Trail. You can see some of the uh, chaparral development that we're all familiar with. 
And in looking at the request, the Planning Commission did unanimously recommend approval of the request by a vote of five to zero. City staff also recommends that you approve this change. If you have any questions, I can answer those now. Motion to approve as presented. Second. Second. Okay, I have uh, Mr. Adams with a motion, Ms. Farmer with a second, Mr. Morrison to be recognized. Yes, so uh, in fact, all we're doing is just formalizing what's already happening out there. Exactly. Other questions or comments from council? Public input on this item? Call for the vote. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. Move forward to item number 10. This is the consideration of approving an appeal of a planning commission's decision to deny case number CU 12-14 requesting the approval of a conditional use to allow for household living for an area currently zoned general commercial specifically at an unaddressed tract of land on the northwest corner of Knickerbocker Road and Valley View Boulevard presentation today by our planning manager AJ Faber. thank you uh, this request you'll notice in your background report was heard by the Planning Commission in November uh, the reason for the delay in that coming to you is that there is a 30-day uh, window in which an applicant can appeal a decision of the Planning Commission and so uh, an appeal was made in accordance with those regulations and we're bringing you this today for your consideration I will also remind you that per the zoning ordinance to overturn a decision of the Planning Commission it does require a supermajority vote six of the seven uh, must vote in favor of that overturn. There were 31 notifications sent out in, in conjunction with this request. I will mention that we notified twice. We actually notified for the Planning Commission's hearing on this item. We also notified a second time, though it's not required by state law, simply to let the residents in the area know that it had been appealed and to give them the opportunity to uh, speak on this matter a second time. The subject property is located at the intersection of Valley View Boulevard and North, uh, I'm sorry, the northwest corner of Knickerbocker Road. This is in far southwest San Angelo. If you continue to go along Knickerbocker Road for a short distance, you'll reach Lake Nasworthy. Here is a closer view of that particular property. The property is surrounded by lots that are platted in different configurations. You'll notice that the lots to the immediate north of the property are platted in a configuration that is consistent with townhome development, and that is how this area has largely developed. Immediately adjacent to the west, you'll also note some smaller lots, but those have developed in a single family type of fashion, so that might be important in your consideration today. Here's an aerial photograph of the area. Again, this lot in question is completely vacant at this time. And here's an excerpt from the vision plan map uh, from our comprehensive plan for the city. The red indicates that it is called for to be a type of commercial designation. It's also currently zoned as a commercial designation. Again, the request here is to augment that zoning by allowing a conditional use for household living in addition to the commercial zoning that would still remain in place. The map I have here for you denotes uh, the notifications that were turned into us. This was what was turned into us as of the date that you received your background packets. We did receive some since, and I will also update you on those. All of the lots in blue on this particular map indicate parties that wrote in in favor of the change. At that time, we had not received any in opposition of the change. We have since received three notifications that came into our office, one as recently as this morning, that indicate uh, their vote in opposition of the request. I can paraphrase these. I can hand these out to you if you'd like to read them yourselves. Certainly uh, your choice. However, I will mention that uh, one of the responses that we received in opposition um, was originally in favor of the proposal. They have since reversed their support to be in opposition of this proposal. It indicates on their form that they changed that vote because they heard at the Planning Commission meeting that there was intended a duplex type of development on the site. Um, and they write in their form that they are not in favor of any sort of duplex or apartment type of building on the site. We also received a second letter from someone that could not be here today. Um, they indicate, just paraphrasing what they've written into us, that they have had some negative experiences with rental properties and they are concerned about the noise and the safety issues that could be generated from allowing this type of development at this site. And then lastly, the third letter in opposition we received talks about decrease in property values, an increase in traffic, 
again, the rental issue being uh, problematic for them and property maintenance uh, experienced as part of being a rental property. So that gets you up to date on all of the letters that we have received, both in favor and in opposition of the request. This is a subdivision plat that was also on the November agenda for the Planning Commission. It was approved at that time because it does, in fact, meet all of the subdivision requirements for the city. What you may notice is that, again, this very large block is proposed to be broken up um, by a street that would be extended northward of Valley View Boulevard. That street would act as a simple local residential street, and it would be... Uh, in place to essentially provide access for property owners coming to the different properties that would be possibly built on lots three through ten and then they also call for this lot two which is just over two and a half acres um, to actually remain as one lot their intent being that at some point in the future it could actually develop commercially in conjunction with the zoning that is in place just a few photographs, uh, again, the property's vacant, so that's what you'll notice throughout the photographs. This is looking at it from Valley View Boulevard. You can see some of the property to the rear of this particular subject property, some of which indicates people that rode in. We do have the residential development here to the left of the photograph, and then here to the center of the photograph, you can see some of the commercial and office park type of development that has been generated along Knickerbocker Road. These are just some photographs of the residences and a closer view, again, of that commercial area along Knickerbocker Road, uh, butting up against the residential properties here to Oak Hills Drive. This, again, is looking southward from Valley View Boulevard and eastward towards Knickerbocker Road. We can look back at those more if you have specific questions about the layout of the property. Planning staff did re recommend approval of the request. Uh, part of the recommendation was based on the fact that the comprehensive plan, which we put into place in 2009 through the City Council and their Planning Commission, does call for transitions between commercial designations and commercial properties and residential properties. And the type of development which is being proposed here would actually create a commercial hub at the intersection. It would then blend into and transition into duplex development, and that duplex development would then transition and step down into single family development. So it's textbook as the way that the comprehensive plan calls for us to see development. So that was one of the main reasons that we looked for a favorable recommendation. Um, on November 19th, which was when the Planning Commission heard this request, they did recommend denial of the request unanimously by a vote of 6-0. to zero. There was a great deal of discussion at that meeting. We had a numerous amount of people that turned out to talk about the discussion, and it really seemed that, and I'm... I'm paraphrasing, but from our view, it seemed that the duplex development really seemed to be the crux of the matter. There were many residents there that were not supportive of having uh, rentals brought into the neighborhood and the type of issues that could stem from that. And most of those issues that they referred to, both in the notification letters and in their testimonies to the Planning Commission, were nuisance related. And I'm sure we may have some that can speak to you about that today. Very briefly, uh, your background report outlined a number of comprehensive plan excerpts that show to support this type of development. I won't go through all of those again. I'll just remind you that as we're looking at a zone change request or a conditional use request, we are obligated to look at the plans and policies that we have in place, the zoning ordinance and the surrounding area, as well as a variety of other issues. But in doing that, city staff again um, recommends approval. I'm going to stop there for now. I do have some other points that we can make, but if you don't have any questions, we can open it up for discussion. Okay, let me start on the end and come this way. Mr. Alexander. Yes, we explain household living sure. on CG, commercial sure. property. How does that work? Household living allows any type of living um, which would constitute basically family as it's defined in the zoning ordinance. Now those families have to be one per unit, but the type of uh -huh. unit can vary. You could go with a single family residential type of development, you could go with a duplex type of development, or you could go with a multifamily type of development that could be uh, fourplexes, triplexes, apartments. Um, when we are taking requests for these types of zone changes and conditional uses, we do not have a mechanism by which we can make the applicant select one of those types. The zoning ordinance allows them to do anything that falls within that designation. 
Now, this brings us to an important point that I should have made a moment ago, and that is that this is a conditional use, which is exactly as it sounds. The City Council and the Planning Commission have the ability to add conditions to the approval that they feel would make this fit in better with the neighborhood. Um, typically, those types of conditions are things such as screening and noise um, types of things, uh, usually focused on nuisance issues, but know that you do have that ability as a council to add conditions to an approval which would limit somewhat the ability of the proponent to develop as can, you see fit. Can we, can we say we, we want it to be RS1, single residential family living? Can we make that kind of condition? No, simply because this is not a zone change, and so a, a zoning so classification couldn't be assigned to so it. So more, a little smaller adjustments than that. Smaller adjustments than that, but you could uh, make requirements such as uh, a site plan would have to be approved, showing the layout. Okay. You could say that the uh, unit size could <coughs> be limited. You could do it in that manner. Uh, garages are required, uh, maintenance is required. But I mean, it can be as detailed as you like, so long as it is intended to make the proposal blend in better with its surroundings. That's the criteria that we have to follow legally. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. AJ. Okay. Mr. Morrison and then Ms. Farmer. If I'm understanding you right, AJ, this is a five <laughs> or six acre plot now. Let me go back and about. show you the subdivision plot. Yeah. <clears throat> You are correct, but as so, of the last meeting, it is no longer one lot. It is now split out into this lot configuration here. But all right now, as of today, this entire this entire <coughs> piece of property is all CG. That's correct. So if they wanted, if somebody wanted to put a wrecking yard or a cement plant or anything else on this right now, N they could do it. Nothing that intensive, but you could see things like um, a big box retail go in there. You could see things like um, different types of auto services. You could see some of those things go in there, yes. That was another uh, thing that we talked about at the planning commission level was um, making it that the change in use actually occurs at the street instead of across the alleys as to prevent commercial traffic from utilizing that alleyway. And what the proponent is trying to do is just to change those seven lots to an RS2 and leave the front that fronts Knickerbocker in the CG? They're actually not going to be changing the zoning on any of these lots. They are simply going to be overlaying, if you will, this okay, conditional understand. use on I top understand. of it. So they want to, to change the use of those seven lots while allowing the part that's already on Knickerbocker, allowing it to remain CG? It will all remain CG. With the special use of the lots. Well, and this conditional use also extends to this front lot. So they could at some point in the future change their mind and, and decide to do the same development with that lot. And the street would divide. The, the street would divide, the yes. the big lot on the front. Yes, sir. Uh, another question I would have, and this is a very exclusive part of town, these are not going to be duplexes like you might find in other parts of town. Are these going to be townhouses like we find on Sunset Boulevard or Southwest Boulevard uh, in these? I'll bring, I'll bring them up and let them answer your questions shortly, the, the folks, the developers Okay, that's what I want to know is what type of duplexes are we planning here? I'll bring them up. If it's something that will fit in the rest of the area. Anything else for Ms. No, Ms. Farmer? AJ, I'm perplexed here. Uh, if you go back to your map showing where it's zoned commercial, I automatically go back to a time just a few six, seven months ago where we considered alcohol sales along Knickerbocker and we showed the entire plan from uh, the Bryant all the way out to the airport mm -hmm. as to what sections were commercial where there was no residential habitation. and. To me, this area is perfectly suited for commercial use. Uh, it's, it makes the great buffer zone before it starts into the residential units. I, for one, have no problem with rental properties, and there's some very exclusive, nice rental properties out in that area currently. But what I do have a problem with is the traffic and the overload. When you have apartment living or two to four or m multiple persons per unit the increased traffic and that brings me to another thought that on not long ago the complaints from both sides of Dickerbocker 
uh, along Valley View, the complaints about the traffic and the citizens who lived there and the traffic counts that we had our own engineering department do, and they were excessive, which called for us, just a few short months ago, lowering the speed limit mm -hmm. on the west side of Valley View because of the heavy traffic. So I am perplexed as to allowing any type of house living in this area, mainly because of the traffic and Knickerbocker being at the high speeds that it is at our gateway, um, it, to me it's suited for commercial and I, I just need to hear argument as to why we should have residential living that close. Okay. Mr. Hirschfeld. And that ends my questions. Thank you. Mr. Hirschfeld. I, I guess when I look at um, look at the can you go back a picture where you're showing the plat okay right there put my glasses on uh, see to me I, I tend to agree that I believe that that actually fits and creates a, a nice barrier to the commercial uh, aspect that would still could still be fronting uh, Knickerbocker Road uh, the other aspect is it, it, it fits with all the residential out there. And one of the problems I've got is that, that here we're, we're trying to tell people, yes, I know they're going for, I mean, what if they did, had not come forward and said it was going to be rental property? What if they had just said, I want to build houses? And would people still be in opposition to that? And, and, but no, now we're, we're, we're picking out because it is they identified it specifically laid all their cards on the table and identified it as rental property you know I, I think there's a lot of good rental property that is around I don't have a problem with it um, I think this tends to fit well with the area out there um, I don't mind having some restrictions or whatever so they keep it clean and nice and you know I uh, but to me, it, it tends to fit. Okay, Mr. Silvas. You know, I, I too, and you, you hit you hit it on the mark, Kendall, when you said uh, the word rental. Because right away, I thought, where where is the proponent uh, going to? Right away, they, they said rental property. They they label it rental right away. I mean, there was no. I believe what they said was duplexes, and through further question and answer session in the planning commission it did, did eventually come to being rentals yes yeah because you know really i don't have any problem with it because right across the street uh, off of knickerbocker you got that the rental properties the apartment complex i don't know how many units are out there but they're rental and i don't see that it's you know uh doing a, a way to the you know to the area you know just making the area even worse off that it's not bad you know so i I too question that is if the proponent label it rental. Uh, that's the way he he or they presented it to you. I think it'll be appropriate for them to come forward and, and speak to that. We simply at the, during the application process, all that they are obligated to provide staff with is what category they wish to uh, utilize, and that category is household living. Um, short of that they are not required to specify which type for us they would like to pursue. It's all encompassed within that category. Yeah, I would like to hear from them and from any of the opponents out there and, and uh, <coughs> hear what they have to say. What, I'm what, pretty what, sure you're going to get your wish. Yes. Uh, okay. Would it be appropriate for me to answer? I want to see if there are any other further questions okay. for your part, and then I'll open it up to public input. And I'll first bring up the developer so that you can ask your specific questions and let the whole process take place of folks that are proponents and po folks that are opposed getting their opportunity to talk. But are, are there any further questions for Ms. Favre before I start that process? Okay. Could I possibly address Ms. Farmer's question? Absolutely. I don't feel like can. I did that. Um, to, to answer one of your questions, you did talk about the traffic, and you're correct. That, that was a concern that we um, looked at, and we our engineering staff also reviewed this uh, proposal with us. And two of the things that we kept coming back to, well, I should say three, actually, uh, were number one, that, that this area is a major intersection. It's one of the few intersections in the city that has two arterial streets um, intersecting. And so 
where better, I guess, is one way that we looked at it. Where else could we find a more appropriate type of intersection in which both streets are already improved to that standard? Um, not that it's the best possible um, situation perhaps, but that was one of the, the questions that we had to ask ourselves. We also talked a little bit about the fact that this proposed residential street does have an outlet to Oak Hills Trail. So as we tried to somewhat project what the use and the activity of this area could look like if it's developed in this way, um, we tend to believe that you would probably see more of the residential traffic exiting out this way so as to avoid the major intersection, whereas most commercial businesses that would want to perhaps utilize this two and a half acres would most likely want their frontage and their entrance to be off of Knickerbocker so as to gain that advantage of visibility. Now these things are projections and speculations, but that's what we're here to do. So that that's kind of where we went down that road um, of discussing the traffic issues. And then thirdly, we also talked about the fact that limiting the size of the residences. Yes, ma'am. Go no, ahead. go ahead. Okay. I just want to follow up with the question okay. that you gotcha. just prompted. Uh, since we were talking about duplexes and we're looking at duplexes on seven lots, we also looked at the type of traffic, the amount of traffic that would generate versus an apartment complex, so on and so forth. So these were all discussions that were had both internally and with the Planning Commission. Is there any type of restriction with the railroad going through right there and the number of rail cars now in backing up stacking up traffic and as that improves is there any restriction by the railroad as to cuts that can be granted off of Dickerbacher into this area that I don't know they would no. actually have to have a formalized application to act text on text. Um, text dot decision mm -hmm. yeah. okay all right I think uh, at this point what I'd like to do is ask mr. Morrison and whomever else you'd like to bring up to answer questions for uh, Mr. Morrison, Mr. Silvas, the questions they have specifically about what your intentions are. So if you could come on up. <coughs> if you like, you can make just a, a short presentation sure. and then take questions. You bet. Will that take care of you? Okay. And identify myself. Please. <laughs> I'm Brad Morris, and I'm the actual owner of the piece of property. And she didn't read my, uh, my reply, but I, if y'all don't mind, I'd like to kind of give you some of my <coughs> thought process and background from uh, where, I, where I'm coming from, if I can get my act together here. And I brought some visuals I'll pass out in a minute. Uh, Anyway, I invested in this large tract of land about six years ago with intentions of developing it. And originally there was talk of somebody, a big box user buying the corner and wanted to kind of worry about the rest of it later. Well, since then it's, you know, our economy kind of went south and, you know, different things have happened. But anyway, the property is way too deep for most commercial uses that want to come in there and have, have kicked tires, so to speak, you know, to, to build anything. And I don't know if I can point on this deal right here. But, with that being said, you know, we've worked with the city staff and tried to create a buffer that totally conforms with the city's master plan, and we're proposing a lower density than the current zoning is right now, as far as going down in zoning. And what we're talking about doing, the cost is going to be major, and like somebody said about the cost of the, of, we're not talking about just building duplexes that are, you know, going to attract some low-end type rent, rental type property. We're talking about something that'll be nice and attractive and enhance the values of the properties instead of, you know, devaluing the properties. Anyway, I, like I said, I've been involved in San Angelo for over 25 years and, you know, I just want to make San Angelo better. So, anyway, I would like to pass out, uh, before I kind of go to my next, we've, a, we've actually sold this last, this corner right over here. It has actually been, oh, you bet. If you just get, get my copies first. I got lots of notes. Uh, okay. Let's see, there's, there's one of them here. It's like a plant or something. I've got pictures from yesterday. They get each one of these, each one of these, and each one of those. Okay, while she's passing those out, this last, this corner down here has actually been sold to a dentist where the, where the arrow's pointing. 
And then, uh, like I so said, we've had some tire kickers on this on this corner, like CVS and Walgreens and some of that kind of stuff. But none of them want anything that deep. Because, I mean, I didn't realize how deep it was when I invested in it six years ago and paid taxes on it for six years, serviced the debt, everything else. So we started looking for a way that might, like I say, buffer what's there and what you know, what's probably going to go in on the front with the growth that San Angelo's seeing right now, we kind of feel like, I mean, and I'm seeing my, t my phone's ringing again, and hopefully something will happen on that corner that'll be a nice, attractive business that everybody can use in that area. And just a quick background for me and why I even bought this piece of property, like I said, I moved to San Angelo about 25 years ago. And... Uh, I married a San Angelo girl when I first moved here. I'm gonna get you, let you get your handouts. Y'all look at this little map right here. When I first moved here 25 years ago, I, bought, I rented a uh, apartment on San Angelo uh, South and Arms Apartments, which I've extended the map just a little bit and labeled, which is a couple of blocks over from this address site. I lived there until I met a girl and married a San Angelo girl. We started raising three kids and we built a house in Bentwood, which is just across the street, down a few blocks away. And so, I think about 2004 came along and I bought a business in Lubbock that required me to move to Lubbock. Well, San Angelo is, till you leave it, you don't realize what you're missing. So, I sold that business, came back to San Angelo, reinvested in the business here, but I've got kids, three kids, so I commuted back and forth for now for, how many years is that? Eight years? Yeah. So anyway, for eight years I've commuted back and forth, and I invested in this property and another business in San Angelo, and can't wait for the day we can come back here and be full time again, but I got one last kid to launch. So we'll get her out of, the, out of the way this next year, hopefully we can do that. But anyway, uh, with all that being said, if you look all around this area, there is, uh, there's rental property. There's duplexes, there's apartments. I mean, and the planning and zoning meeting kind of got out of hand. We weren't prepared for opposition last time. There was zero opposition letters that came in. So it, instead of it being really about what we're asking for, it kind of turned into a meeting of neighbors versus what's right or wrong because they were worried about their property values. Well, what it's going to cost to build this street and the type of structures we're going to build there is not going to be something that's going to hurt anybody's values. So I passed out one. I was, I, I was actually going to live in one of these properties, but because of the delay, I went ahead and bought a house in Bentwood again about 45 days ago. And on this map, my new house is right here. Yesterday morning, I'm leaving. I gave you a picture of a house on Fairway Drive that's for rent for $2,500 a month. That's this house right here. Well, let's see. I might give it away. Yeah. Yeah, that one. Okay. And on the corner, as you're going to, from my house to this piece of property, on this corner right here at Valley View and Westway Drive, Two new pad sites were going up yesterday morning. Both of them are going to be duplexes, backing up to Bentwood Residential. So, I mean, it just conforms. I mean, like I said, everything it, that I think that does the neighbors a favor, it doesn't hinder their property values. So the traffic is going to be so minimal because there's an alley behind, behind the houses in this lot right here that run, but there's an alley that these houses here have rear entry garages too. So if we build structures here that have rear entry garages, the only traffic that you're gonna get is gonna be visitors coming to the front of the property. Well, how, how much better it could get. So we're talking about eight lots, you know, maybe seven, just depending on what size and restrictions that we come up with. So that's kind of the end of the story. Questions for him? I think you answered most of my questions. I just, you know, I was concerned as to what type of duplexes you were going to build, but it looks to me like you're going to build something pretty nice. Yeah, well, I'll, I'll kind of share with you one story. Back when I was a high, senior in high school, my dad and my grandfather were both home builders. 
and I grew up in a little town east of Dallas in Greenville, Texas. And I think it was 1979, I was a senior in high school. He built some structures similar to this for my grandparents to live in, basically, so they'd be safe. And we, we're going to maintain these things. We're going to build a brick wall that's going to actually buffer uh, this right here. It's going to be a brick, solid brick wall all the way from, uh, none of this was addressed at the planning and zoning because, like I said, we just thought we were trying to get a special use permit, and that was it. So we're going to build a brick wall that's going to be nice and, uh, you know, aesthetically, uh, is that the right word? Aesthetic. <coughs> Right, very good right here you know all the way down this all, all the way down this right here so that'll actually separate it that even that much more but the story I was going to share with you was that uh, when I was a senior in high school my grandparents wanted to kind of sell their house they lived on a farm they want to move into town so my father and grandfather built these similar type situation we had neighbors all around complain about it they said oh, we're gonna have rental property all this kind of stuff what well, was funny a couple of years later some of these neighbors complained wanted to get on the waiting list to get in one of these vehicles in these uh, particular type situations so well these could be purchased and yeah they own. could be purchased yeah so we say rental but that doesn't mean that it's exactly going to be rental people could buy these things yeah and they're all over southwest san angelo along along southwest boulevard and back in there off soil ross we had those things all down everywhere. valley view into bentwood i mean it's just i mean there's various you answered my there's question. various type and it conforms and just kind of in, in my mind, well, we, we put a lot of effort into it. We didn't just come up with this overnight, come up with some, hey, we're going to try to, you know, recoup some of the money we've got invested in this property because, I mean, like I said, I, I've lived in Bentwood twice now. I plan on living there <coughs> again permanently, so I'm going to be a block away. And Mr. So I think you answered mine also. I, I believe that uh, – some maybe and i'm guessing i don't know i haven't heard what the opponents have to say but i would imagine they're they're worried about you building some kind of low you know just well i told them before i said they're the kind of neighbors we're looking for we're not trying to run anybody off so you, you know, you're looking at building some high-end high -end, luxury uh, duplexes or whatever you like want to the, do. this this place right here that i gave you a picture of is for rent for twenty five hundred dollars a month you know, and, I, and I too question, just like uh, Kendall said, that if you hadn't have thrown that word, I don't know who threw it in, the the word rental, maybe we wouldn't be here. Exactly. But uh, if you're going to maybe allow some of these folks to purchase the properties, nice looking properties, we may be okay. I don't know. Well, I, what I'd like to do first is build them and then lease them to, you know, I to class, you know, what I saw evolve in the, in my experience with something similar was. Know, just the progression of life is you'd have kind of mom and pop move in, pop would kick off, then the mom, then the widow ladies would kind of nest together, you know, and share their meals or whatever, and then they'd still have a separate place to stay, you know. Uh, anyway, kind of look after each other, <laughs> you know, so. Uh, okay. Other questions for the gentleman before we go to the next? Yes, ma'am. Ms. Farmer. Mr. Morris, what? You don't have any plans on the, on the construction or the type of unit, the materials or anything at this point. Is that correct? Well, just because of the cost of the street and everything else, it's going to be something rock and brick and stucco and I mean. Well, the, the point nice. I was trying to get at and, and get to, I mean, it, it's not a tax credit property, uh, and it is in a, a high rent zone or district and renters are not all bad uh, I've had really great experiences with renters that's not been my objection I've rented at South and Arms twice and then the reason I went back out there because it was 25 There's years later and they've kept them up and it's the nicest part of town some great professors at ASU that are renters and that's it's the question of traffic and how we as a city handle it sure is my only objection which is waning and I, I because I do support renters and I do support buffer zones if the quality of the construction is c in compliance with the, the balance of the neighborhood. That's the kind of restriction I welcome you to put on us because we, we want to do something that's conforming and nice and, and attractive for everybody. If the quality of the construction is in compliance with the neighborhood, I, I wouldn't oppose at all. Okay, Ms. Farmer. Mr. Alexander. My question was similar. Is there any architectural restrictions? I live in Bentwood, and I'm telling you, I, I do the wrong thing. I get a phone call. I mean, there is a strict restrictions about I can't even park a boat out in 
my driveway more in a couple of days, but you also have to use all brick and or stucco, and, and there's all these restrictions. You got to have your garage on the side. Uh, we welcome any of that. Like I said, I said we, we didn't even get that far because what we were trying to do is just do something that matched the master plan of the city. We worked with the staff intensely to get everything, get over all, all our P's and Q's just right. So okay, here, here's the problem. We're at city council right now, and for us to come up with that architectural restriction plan is fairly tough. But can you kick it back to planning and zoning and say you, we you, might could because I think it has to be in place to control the quality that Ms. Farmer's talking about. I think it has to be in place so you even have a possibility here. And I, and I did bring this up to some of the investors. I mean, one of them, but it really is necessary. And so I'm just, I'm just bringing that up. It, it, to me, it's very important. Well, you're asking a question. Let Ms. Farmer answer it right Okay. It, it's a good, good question. Um, what we typically see with our planning commission is that they will either A, um, table a request until they have materials in front of them, or B, they will designate a specific person, the planning manager, the, the planning division, or the planning commission, you could delegate this to them, someone to review the plans and to make that call, because ultimately we can say what our intentions are, but someone has to make sure that those intentions are met. Well, we have a year to do this, right? If we were to go forward with this and approve it, if, and we haven't heard the other side. I've heard the other side. It's pretty interesting. But if we were do, to do this, I think we'd have to have these architectural restrictions in place. I think it'd have to happen. And so I, I don't see us approving it today. I see us tabling it for more restrictions and more clarification. Because when it comes to the very end here, what's going to happen is clarification is going to be vague, and it's going to be hard to make a decision for us as council members. And yeah. you'll see what I'm saying when you hear the other side. And I think the other question that you have to answer in doing that is who is the appropriate body that works routinely with these types of restrictions that would be best suited to to oversee those? Okay, so so we go forward. I'd like to decide. side. Okay. When you, the question, I'm just an, saying there's an interesting other got side. Another council, <laughs> got another council member that'd like to speak, Mr. Hirschfeld. Uh, one of my concerns, and I, I, to me, I think Ms. Farmer hit it, is that we want it to. Uh, conform with the surrounding neighborhood and to me I'd, I'd, I'm not really a proponent of saying okay I want red brick and a blue door and windows that are this big and no 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 that that's not our job I don't believe I believe that we are out of place and trying to request that kind of level of detail I believe and I think we could we could remand it to the planning not the commission, but the planning department, and say that it would have to conform generally with with surround with that surrounding neighborhood, and could something like that fly? You could. Uh, you might recall that when you did the plan development districts for both Shannon and Howard College, that was written into the requirements was that the, the planning director or planning manager oversee what the proposals were, and if there was any misgivings about the proposals, that decision could be appealed back to you for a final decision. Because, I, I, I mean, you need to have, because you're a developer, you and whoever else, need to have the flexibility and the opportunity to do what you want. But, you know, I think we're, we're just saying we would like for it to be just with – and it doesn't have to keep the same style. I I, I'm very open to that. You, you see what I'm saying? That I want it to be. I think it's. It just needs to let uh, retain with the level of class of homes, and the appearance of the class of homes that are in that area. And, and and I'll say that that I was a resident. I lived at 2733 Oak Hills Trail. Okay, and so I was right around the corner of that thing, and I would. I would probably not, I would be on the side of, I would be for it. I don't have a problem with it, regardless whether I would be living there or not. So, but it's a nice neighborhood. I know it. I lived it. I walked it. And so that would be my concern there is I want to make sure that it keeps with the intent Thanks, of the neighborhood. Not a problem. Okay, further, before I move the process forward, further questions for these folks? He did. You did mention you had what a year time frame I think or there's a, a year for us to get the project started or the special use condition is only good for a year because it's Ms. Father there's these you're you're going to need to 
provide clarity on what Mr. Silvis asked? I'm sorry, I didn't hear the question. You talk about a time frame that he has? Conditional uses um, must be, a, a permit must be pulled essentially to start the work within one year of the date of approval. There is an opportunity for one one year extension of that through the planning manager. Now, when I say permit, remember that's not the end of the project, that's actually the beginning of the project. Sure. Okay. Okay, other questions? I'd like the, um, the others. Well, excuse me. Okay. I will, uh, sir, you, you're, I'm going to let you be the first one to the mic. I think we're through asking questions. Uh, and folks, what I'd like you to do at this point, whether you're a proponent or whether you're an opponent, how about uh, y'all are basically up at the front of the room anyway, but I'd like to get you close to the front of the room so that as someone <laughs> steps up and speaks, you're able to step up right behind them and just keep it as orderly as possible. Uh, respect and decorum is a part of the process, so um, I'm looking for respect and decorum. So, sir, kick us off, okay? Mr. Morris, I think you can have a seat, and, more and I think we're good to go. Okay, thank you. Hi, my name is Louis Blanick, and I've been chosen or hired to be the contractor on these duplexes. And so what y'all were discussing was whether or not it would be up to the quality of the existing houses in the neighborhood and most definitely it will be they're going to be rock brick and stucco uh, we're dealing right now with uh, 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 an ordinance that y'all are requiring because we want the pitch of the roof to be uh, 9 or 10 and 12 to get really a, a, a spectacular elevation and what have you and and we've got the situation where anything that exceeds seven and a half foot in the attic is considered square footage and the square footage of these properties are going to be in the neighborhood of 1,800 to 2,000 square feet per side on the duplexes. They're going to be the high quality uh, skip trial uh, uh, texture inside, uh, granite, uh, uh, no fiberglass tubs or what have you. It's going to all be tile and marble. Uh, it's going to be uh, the high dollar marble tile and what have you. They're looking at you know rental ranges in the neighborhood of uh, somewhere between eighteen hundred and twenty two hundred dollars per side. Uh, so so to clarify all that, uh, we're not building something shabby. You and you don't go out there and build something and spend three hundred seventy five four hundred twenty five thousand dollars on a duplex and uh, and let it run down. Okay, thank you, sir. Thank you. Who would like to speak next? You're welcome just to come up, okay? Here you go, hi. Just introduce yourself and- Greg Keeling. Okay. I live at 5114 Blue Ridge Trail. Uh, I spoke during the commission hearing and I'm here to speak out against it again. I was in opposition of it, I still am. Uh, I was born and raised in San Angelo. When I was going to college and working here, uh, I lived in a similar setup, a rental duplex on Wilder Eye Trail. It's on the corner of Bermuda and uh, Green, Green Meadow. Okay. Uh, at the time, I couldn't afford the rent on my own because it was a high-end area. And, uh, but I got two college buddies of mine, and we moved in, and it was doable then. At one point, we had four people living there. Uh, there were other college kids in the area that were doing the same thing, and it was... Uh, that whole two block area was, was pretty much a bunch of young kids at the time. Uh, there were a lot of problems that came about from that. Uh, a lot of parties, <coughs> a lot of police were always getting called, disturbances, property crimes. Uh, parking issues were just total chaos. We had two parking spaces per unit. We had three vehicles living at ours, at one time four vehicles living there. And uh, you'd come home from work or school, somebody else would be in your parking space, you'd have to park in somebody else's or, or we'd block the alley, uh, park in the grass, park around the block on, on the street. It was just, uh, it, it just kind of chaotic. And at the time, the property that we were living in sold to another, another owner. And uh, I looked up the tax records on it last week and those two owners aren't even listed on there. There's been so many, it's changed hands so many times since then. Uh, I don't want that happening in my neighborhood. 
Uh, if you if you go by there today and look at Wild Eye Trail, uh, you'll see that, that those duplexes are in all states of disrepair. Uh, there's there are all kinds of owners over there at that property, uh, and I presume most of them probably don't even live there. But there's it's not just one corporation that owns it; it's fractured out and has several different owners. My uh, my better half and her her former husband built the home that we live in in 1995. Uh, they're one of their, her biggest concerns when buying that property was the land that was behind them. They did not want an apartment situation going up behind them. And uh, their, their security was that it was commercial zoned. And so they built the home. Uh, now I live there with her. And we're homeowners. We have a mortgage. Everyone in our neighborhood are homeowners. We have no rental property in our affected area here. Uh, just this past year, we've built a new privacy fence, uh, a city-approved carport. We're doing a kitchen remodel right now. You know, we, we take pride, take pride in our home. And I just, I know from experience that renters don't. You know, it's, they start out with good intentions, but uh, it just doesn't always end up that way with the rental property. Uh, I mentioned it before at the commission hearing that uh, if these were individual lots with custom-built homes like what we're living in, I wouldn't be here today opposing this. Uh, because I know what would be coming in behind us. I would get to know our neighbors and... They would be fellow homeowners, you know, with a mortgage, with a house payment, and not just somebody that's temporarily there. At the commission hearing also, uh, Ms. Boggs, uh, who sits on the planning commission, she used a legal term that I, I kind of really liked that pertained to this and it was quiet use and enjoyment. And she said it was the city's obligation to assure the citizens have quiet use and enjoyment of their homes. And there's no truer words could be said. Uh, okay. I think the Planning Commission did the right thing when they denied this request. All right, thank you very much. I appreciate your presentation. Good morning. Good morning. I'm a widow. I'm Frida Ingram, and I live in uh, 8A of that block. And I agree with Mr. Keeling, everything he said, only I said uh, renters, most, a lot of them just do not take care of the property, and uh, they move in and out quite often. <clears throat> and uh, with the rent being high, like I say, it'll probably take two or more families to afford it. And uh, it'll be noisy, all the traffic around there. Uh, and uh, <coughs> they say they're building eight duplexes for three or 400,000. And that's not very much money for eight. I, I believe that number's up per each. Yes. Okay, the three or 400,000 is per duplex, not? Per duplex? Yes, ma'am. Oh, okay, I misunderstood that. But anyway, I just wanted to state that why I was against it and that I agree with Mr. Keeling. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Good morning. Good I'm Verna Leggett, and I currently reside at 26, uh, 2622 Oak Hills Trail, and I faced the property. One of the reasons we bought our property was the fact that it was on a cul-de-sac, and we do have, I have a dog. San Angelo doesn't currently have a dog park here. I've only been here since 05. And I like the fact that I can go and let my dog and I roam up and down the street without the benefit of people careening around the street. So my major concern is the fact that you are gonna open up my cul-de-sac that I currently live on to more traffic. 
And if it's as they say, the rent is going to be $2,500 between $18 and $2,200. And there is the benefit of more than one occupant because my son currently lives in that type of environment. And um, my concern is mostly is, is, the, is the increase in traffic. My home butts up against, across the alleyway, townhouses. And as the older couples are passing on and their kids are in, um, inheriting these properties, they're turning into rental properties. And I'm not liking that. I'm not liking the fact that I come out and I have more garbage than I generate in my trash bin. These are small little things, but it's an encroachment onto my property. And that's what I have to currently deal with, missing items. And that's just now. So when you throw in the excess traffic and the quiet use of Milo Street, I'm, I'm just not, I'm, I'm not for that. I mean, one or two people, a party every now and again. But if they're going to do something like that could possibly happen, you guys are looking at today, I'm looking at 15 years down the road when I'm still sitting there. And he may have, in turn, decide, because he's a businessman, to make a deal and it passes on and it passes on. We're making investments because we're planning on staying. He, is he going to make that same commitment to us and say he's not 10 years down the road going to transition to another business obligation for himself, opportunity, should I say, for himself? We have that, don't have that guarantee, and I know you can only make a decision based on what's presented to you today. But as the old Japanese folks used to do, we got a 10-year plan going on in my household. In that situation, I don't want to look at my door and look at crap. He says it's not going to be crap today, but 10 years down the road when I can't afford to, my, I've already ex, ex, uh, exhausted my ability to make an income and I'm living on a pension. That's one of my concerns. The increase in traffic on my street, you say it's going to be a buffer. I very seldom hear the train go by. I very seldom hear traffic on my street because there is, isn't any because there's only four houses and we all pretty much have to have uh, back entrances to our homes. The people that I live with currently, they don't have that much company coming over. They don't have that much, there's not that much, if any at all, people parking on, on the street currently. So I can go out there with my dog, with my son, throw the football and play in my street. I don't, I don't want to lose that, but like, you know, like I said, you can only make a decision based on what's presented to you today. Thank you. Good Hi. I'm Bill Roberts. Dwayne, good to see you. Alvin, good to see you. Uh, I live at 2614 Oak Hills Trail, right across from the proposed property. Uh, guys, I put a lot of uh, work into keeping my place up to date and done a lot of uh, renovations on it. And uh, I'd like to see the neighborhood stay that way. Uh, you know, when I look across there, yeah, I'd like to have something put in there, but I'd like to have something put in there with, with a little bit of thought about all the rest of us that live in that neighborhood. Now, granted, the homes down Blue Ridge Trail, uh, but if you look at all the other homes in the neighborhood down Oak Hills Trail, there's some beautiful homes around there. Santiago Canyon, there's some beautiful homes. And, uh, you know, uh, this, this area is not huge. Uh, and I don't even see you putting these duplexes in there. I'd like to see maybe a couple of uh, custom-built homes or something of that nature go in there. And uh, if you're going to have something commercial on the front of that property, then, then put something good on that, on that one side. At least it would uh, fit in with the rest of the properties. And so I'm totally against this duplexes <coughs> because rental property is just not going to do it. Okay? Okay, thank you, sir. Where am I getting that feedback? Do you guys have any idea? Mm -hmm. I don't know. Good morning. I'm E.J. Roberts. I live at 5118 Blue Ridge Trail. Uh, I appeared with Mr. Keeling and some of our other good neighbors at the uh, hearing by the Planning Commission. I agree with what my neighbors have said. When you think about 16 different living areas in one block using an alley that we are currently using and you know as well as I do that it be darn unusual for a family to have less than two vehicles 
Okay, well, let's just do the math. That's 32 damn vehicles to go along with the ones that we already have using that same alley. Uh, Ms. Farmer over here mentioned something about traffic. Uh, there's children in our area. There's dogs in our area. We just think it would take away from our property values, from our quality of life. And I know this guy wants to make a fast buck. So do I. But this is not the way to do it. I suggest if you want to do some rezoning, how about going to RS1? That's single family residences. I don't think any of us have a big objection to that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good morning. I didn't move up near enough to the front. My name is my name is Jim Whitten. I live at 5126 Blue Ridge Trail and uh, <clears throat> I have lived and worked everywhere from uh, way up north in Fargo, North Dakota, all the way down to almost to the Guatemalan border. A, a change happens. Change is hard to accept at times, but it does happen. I don't have any, uh, any uh, problem with what has been proposed with respect to the type of buildings there if they just didn't have the word rental. Uh, I've had one or two surgeries since we have moved to San Angelo and my, and, and my doctors have advised me to do some walking. Blue Ridge Trail, if you haven't been on it, is a very wide street so I can walk all the way down to Loop 306 and uh, back and that's about my half hour walk. Whenever I cross over to uh, Palo Duro, there are a number of those uh, townhouses, I suppose that's what you call them, are rentals. A lot of times I have to dodge all the vehicles that are involved with some of those rental units. And, and I usually try to walk three to three to five days a week there. So I see a lot of what happens <coughs> whenever I see some of the rental cars which have moved out. It's not long thereafter I see remodelers coming in and taking care of things. So uh, I think the word rental is really what has gotten most of us stirred up. I don't know how you work your way around that, but uh, I thank you for the opportunity to to uh, be here this morning. Thank you, sir. Good morning. Uh, my name is Chris Abad, and I live on Blue Ridge Trail as well. I grew up in San Angelo. My husband and I did, and we lived over in the Wall School District. We moved away in '03 to the Houston area, and um, we've purchased four homes together and every time we purchased a home I purchased it without even considering the neighborhood or the neighbor and every time we bought a home it was there was a rental property next door and so we had horror stories of parking and uh, uh, people just m moving in and out leaving trash um, the people that own the home selling the home so we just had nightmares so Moving back in 2006, my husband requested, please consider the neighborhood, please consider. I left before him because he had to uh, finish his work uh, assignment. And so when I came down with the budget that I had, I looked all over San Angelo and he gave me a few neighbor, a, a few areas that I could pick a home in. And I finally, um, my final result was on Blue Ridge. And I did consider there was no rental property next to me. I visited my neighbors, and I did realize it was a commercial zone behind me, but I thought oh, we can handle the business because I'll keep the, the premises <coughs> clean, and, and there won't be the high, the rental property. So buying uh, this home was a great a, a feat, a great accomplishment for both of us. However, I do consider, after we found out about the rental duplex consideration, all that idea, it was very, I frowned upon it and so did he. Um, there is the tracks that do go through there 
and when I'm coming home sometimes, I do have to avoid the line of, line of cars that are there. So I cut off on Palo Duro. I create traffic there as well, and then everyone else does as well. So I also utilize Oak Hills cul-de-sac to get into my neighborhood through the alley and come in behind into my garage. If that, if that rental property comes up, that's just more of a nightmare, more traffic, because we avoid that. And we always um, notify each other. My husband called me, hey, the, tra the train's coming across. You know, cut through, cut through. So I can imagine all those duplexes with two ha uh, cars or more. We had two kids. We had two drivers that were two years apart, so we had four cars. I felt so horrible during that time for my neighbors because my daughter and my son would park in the back or in the front, and I would tell them to park in the back, and then I felt bad for my neighbors because we, we had a lot of cars there. They're gone. I have a Marine and I have a nurse now. They both left, so I kind of feel a little relieved that we're not tying up. So that's just, I was considerate of that, and I just hope you guys consider that for us as far as traffic and I took lots of procedure. I mean, I took precaution to not buy next to rental property. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, my name is Nancy Vincent, and most of you guys I've worked with a couple times before. I am a real estate agent. And what I, just to kind of address a couple of the things that I think are concerns, and you know, we, this comes up a lot, you know, when we're selling homes, people have, you know, is there going to be rental property? Is there a barking dog next door? You know, we never, you never really do know that. But I think what the concerns are is mainly about the type of, of, of structures that are going to be built and what kind of people you're going to have in this. And from everything I've talk to Lewis and the developers and this is not going to be uh, you know where you're going to have people that are going to be in and out and you know doing a lot of things that would be not uh, acceptable to any neighborhood there are two car garages in each one of them so it's just like I mean most of the homes around there are two car garages the Oak Hills Trail Range and, and all of uh, Santiago Canyon, I don't think any of them have more than two car garages. So I think you're looking at a new, a different type of rental property than what maybe folks that have been involved in rental property are visioning, you know, because there are some of these kind of rental properties in San Angelo and they're very well maintained. They're, you know, when you're spending the kind of money, $300,000 per unit, you're not going to let them go downhill, you know, and you're always going to be sure that they're rented by the kind of people that are going to take care of them. And there are ways to control that. You know, there are uh, laws out there for, you know, people. I think what they're envisioning is more of the baby boomers. You know, there's there's been this need for a long time in San Angelo. People come out of their bigger home and they're looking for something small and easy to take care of that, you know, and these people are going to be kind, the kind of people that I think will take good care of this property. I think they're going to be beautiful. They're going to have granite and, I mean, no different from a regular residential home. And um, I just think the, the rental word is what's scaring people, and I don't think that's going to be the case in this situation. Okay, thank you. Thank you. <coughs> Other public uh, input? Mr. Keeling, um, I think it's time for me to go ahead and move to a vote, okay? All right. I, I, I need a motion. Discussion. Okay. Yes? Could I ask a question? Absolutely. What I, all I was going to say is I need a motion, I need a table, I need, a, I need something that moves us forward or further comment up here. That's what but I need. I have two questions that I need answered, and I'll do my comment with okay. it in possibly a motion. I, I don't know. I wanted to respond, and that get, I'll get to my questions, but quiet, peaceful enjoyment of living is the right of everyone, even renters. Uh, the success of any rental property is the responsibility of the property owner and the property resident. There are current laws, as the lady just mentioned, there are current laws that govern the property owner to take care of the property as well as the renter what they can and cannot or may do 
San Angelo is just beginning to exercise those laws and do right by both entities. But by your own admission, the word rental is what you oppose to. I have to ask the question, would you be opposed to a gated community, even if it were rental? You know, there are rentals in gated communities all over the state. Uh, the one that comes to mind is right down by Rice University in Houston. Uh, very high-end rentals. And then my other question is, who is the management company <coughs> going to be from day one? Because again, the success of the neighborhood toward a rental property is definitely the management. And if that management is going to screen your applicants, their background and their histories and uh, criminal background checks and so forth that a lot of your communities do. And I, I need to know who that management company is going to be, but it can only answer the question for me for right now. It won't answer the question two years from now, three years from now, and I don't think anybody can answer that question. But I can also tell you that tomorrow, each of us who own property, our home could be a rental property depending on the circumstance. I can't justify vetoing or saying no to a subdivision development or a rental property development or a housing development or a business development just because a small community in our large community doesn't like the word rental. That to me becomes highly prejudicial and uh, I have to consider what's good for the city. Our city, in my opinion, is in need of high-end rentals. It's in need of a gated community. It's in need of a lot of things that we're working toward. And uh, if someone could answer me, possibly Mr. Morris, with who he intends on being his management company, uh, then my decision will be a, an easy one. And then my other question is to, would you oppose any of you uh, that are opposed, would you oppose a gated rental community? Okay, Mr. Morris. As far as your question regarding the management company, <coughs> yes, we will be the managers. Okay. And we will very tightly screen the applicants because the audience we're after we want them up kept. So Thank you. Okay. Is there someone prepared to, to answer the question about the gated community? Oh, just gated. one. Just right, one. Everybody. Just just one. You know, person who maybe speaks for overall how they feel about a rental gated community. <laughs> we have that problem up here sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> I don't. I don't really understand what what you'd mean by a gated community i'd have to i guess see it look at it. are you talking about like southridge which is just south of us the southridge neighborhood no it's it's a gated community that you have access key card access in. or security 24 hours a day and, and most of those have a like a fence or parameter they're, they're fence. surrounded by a wall mm -hmm. a fence some sort uh no I, I would have no problem with that because you would either live there or you wouldn't if you lived adjacent to it, I guess you'd have a, a wall or a fence between you and you wouldn't have that traffic, influx of traffic coming in and out. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Uh, I, I would, if there are no other questions, I am uh, prepared to make a motion okay, to approve me, at this time. Mr. With, oh, I'm let me sorry. ask Mr. Alexander uh, sure. some suggestions as far as the motion Great. goes. Great. I'd love to hear them. If AJ, when, when AJ, I've been very patient. I'm just going to, I do have, this is AJ. First you answer and then I'll, I'll give my point of view on this. Okay. Well, if I could first respond to and Ms. Farmers, um, I, I do want to make sure that we make the council aware of the fact that our subdivision ordinance does require with subdivision approval to publicly dedicate their streets. And so gated communities that are entirely encompassed and have private streets, you might remember one that we brought to you recently 
um, because the developer went out of business and they are asking us to take those streets back, there are some complications. I would be remiss if I didn't remind you of that. Okay. Let me just remind everybody, my, my degree is in environmental design. This is basically architecture, maybe a building, but maybe an entire block. And so this is what my profession, this is what I do, this is what I trained in. And then I also, uh, my <coughs> family, they're builders. They've built 1,600 houses. So we're developers. Uh, I'm a business person. I worked towards an MBA, didn't quite get it. I went into business, so I didn't get it. But so I, I, I'm on both sides of this where, you know, this is a money decision. It's also an aesthetic architectural decision. Uh, and I can say that this puts this council in a difficult <coughs> position because I'm watching this. This is pitting neighbor against neighbor. And <coughs> as a leader here, I, I would say, please bring me a win-win solution. And to do that, you would each have to know each other's sides completely and have the creative ability to work this out before you brought it to us. And it's not in a worked out form right now, which is a problem. And I'd say the intentions are good. I'm hearing what we're going to put in. I understand the intentions are very good. The clarity of scope is vague uh, from the standpoint of what we are approving, which is a household living overlay. Household living encompasses RS1 all the way to apartments. So we didn't target RS2 and be clear about this. We just, it's household living. Right, and we're we, not legally allowed to. And we as a council are only approving the household living overlay. So we can't even hardly talk about whether it's rental or not rental you yeah. ha you have before you a request for conditional use, so you do have the right to and impose I'm, conditions. And I'm going to move into that. So Ms. Farmer can still hear me in the back, and this is where I'm going, and I'm going to make some suggestions. Uh, I, I've researched both sides. I know people on both sides of this. I've had a very open mind, uh, and, and so it's, it's, and it's incumbent on me to find a win-win solution that everybody can walk away and be happy with. I know you're wondering, how the heck am I going to do this? Well. This plan does not necessarily fit the existing residential RS1 plan, ne the, ne the neighbors. You have an RS1 neighborhood, and then you put household living next to it. They don't necessarily coincide together, necessarily, because it's unpredictable what you could put in a household living uh, overlay. And so I'm going through my notes here so I can shorten this. The, the question is, can this be a win-win? And the answer is yes. The, uh, the proponents have already said that if you put RS1 here, it's win-win. And so we know so that can be a win-win. So I'm thinking, okay, but that's not something we can consider today. So how can we make this work? And I think our tool here is to implement appropriate architectural restrictions that really nail down what's going to happen over here and how it's going to be controlled in such a way that it doesn't get out of control in 10 years. And so my suggestion, Ms. Farmer, is when you make a uh, motion, is that you, you allow me? My motion is to send this back to the planning, to, to somebody. I'm not an expert on who it goes to. Send it back for specific architectural restrictions that fit the proponents and, and the develop, developers and to make everybody happy because it can be done. I, I've, heard, I've heard what is the problem and I've heard solutions and I know it can be done. You know, where is the garage in the back, the front, the side? These are very important. The <coughs> garage is in the back, they're using the alley to get in and out. If the garage is in the front, they're using that street to get in and out and they leave the neighbors alone. They don't, all those cars are not their problem now. And they're, because their garages and the existing houses are in the back. And so they're, they're backing into these other cars. And I've seen this in other parts of town. These people, people call me up and say, people are parking in my alley because they can't fit in their driveway and they're blocking my access to my own carport. And I, so this is the kind of things that could happen with the rental situation. It can be done. So my motion is to send it back for appropriate architectural restrictions. Bring those restrictions to us so we can approve it in a win-win manner. I have a question. Okay, Mr. Adams. I haven't said anything throughout this process because I have been straddled the fence. Uh, I can see what both sides are saying and I think they both make very valid points. So before I, I support your motion, 
I have to ask those residents, homeowners that are opposed to this, uh, would they be in agreement with that? Um, because if, if they're not going to support that, if, if we can't come to your win-win situation, Good then I am going. Then I am going to. My vote is going to be to uphold the planning decisions. Um, outcome their vote. Their vote on this. They would have to be but involved. It, as I said, but if if they can agree to work together and make this a win-win situation, then I'm then I'm all for it. Then they're bringing us a win-win that we can approve with good conscience and in neighborly fashion here, like we are in San Angelo. We are neighbors in San Angelo. We get along well. We're friendly. Let's keep that alive in San Angelo instead of sending everybody away and half of these people are, are not happy. Uh, that's, that's just not a San Angelo way of doing business. Well, keep in mind there are some procedural regulations we have to follow. And, and those so are? we need to talk about those. Okay. Um, your obligation as a, as a council to act on the conditional use is to act on it as it is proposed. We cannot require the applicant to give you a very specific type of application. Their only requirement is to apply for a category which the zoning ordinance covers and we have that now. You do have the ability to make those conditions that are architectural in nature, but it would be the appropriate way to proceed for this commission, this council, the commission, or someone else that is designated to come up with those specifications. We have to act on the application as it was turned in, right. not send them back to the drawing board and make them come up with an application that we want to see. Right. That's outside of the purview of what we can do. And the application that is, that is received has flaws that, that make it weak as, in terms of win-win. And so That's what true, but it meets the do? legal requirements. What can we do to modify what we have now? You can. And I know that you said we can fine-tune the requirements. And I, and I have a list I can get into it require front-facing garages, master landscaping plan for renters. If there's a renter, there has to be a master landscaper in charge. Uh, roof pitch, eight plus, you know, eight to 12 pitch. Uh, the size of the buildings have to be 1,800 square feet or greater. You know, we can go through these, but this is not the place to go through these. Actually, it is, we, because the requirement can we, can you for- Can me? If you let me finish, I'll explain that there's different ways that you can do that. You can either do that in open session today, or you can delegate that to another body. But to delegate that to the applicant is not appropriate. Delegate it to another body. Such as you? Either my staff, myself, or the planning commission would be the ones that I would suggest to may, choose may from. I? Yes, please. Okay. Uh, I'm going to go back to kind of the, the position that I took on this thing, and that is that, that I would be in favor. I, I don't want to kick it down the road. I think that, you know, that we need to get, get this thing settled and move on. Plus, I'm concerned about I, – I'm concerned about – putting all these too many stipulations on the thing I would rather put a general guideline and my guideline is that it needs to conform or be compatible visually compatible uh, with surrounding neighborhood I mean to me that's the answer and that gives flexibility to you to say no that's what we need to have because that's what the neighborhood goes it does, and it gives flexibility in the developer to, to whether he wants to go stucco or brick or rock or, I mean, I don't want to tell him what he has to, he has to use white rock or this. No, that to me, we're going, that, that's stepping beyond, but it needs to be compatible. And, I, and we've already heard from the builder and we've heard from the developer that that's his intent. That's what he's got on the plans. And so I think it's appropriate to kick it back where the planning department helps control that and would that be effective and there's two ways you can do okay. that you can either approve it today subject to the condition that everything be vetted through the planning department or you can table it and have staff come up with proposed conditions for you to place on the application I thought you were going somewhere else, and I was wondering, what is your tool to control that? And then you went back, right back to where I was, and, and either one of those are fine with me, but you, it has to involve the residents, all of them, to where everybody's working on this, not just, they have to be a part of the process. That, that's, that's a requirement for me. Okay, uh, the, the fact is I have a motion, and it, then it sounds like it's not an actionable motion. So I want to get you to reword 
clean it up a little there bit. There are two options. Send it back to the planning department and allow them to place restrictions and bring it back to us. You or can allow us to work up a new proposal Senate with conditions that we would like to see placed. Or they may not make everyone happy. We right. may not be able to do that. But we can bring you a list of conditions that we feel meet your concerns. Or you can approve it subject to the condition that all of these issues for architectural design and site layout be approved by the planning department. And if the planning department chooses not to approve it, it comes back to you for final decision. We have to do it in a way that there's an appeal process in place and there is someone designated to make a decision. I mean, you got ideas on which one's better? Let me let Ms. Farmer make a run at her motion, okay? And see if it gets a second and moves okay. us forward. Ms. Farmer? I don't think I've got enough air. <coughs> um, I will make the motion that today's action be approved subject to Ms. Faber being the planning one who, department. planning department that oversees the construction and the issues that we've covered today. Is that too broad? Con conforming with the uh, with Conforming to the neighborhood, conforming to the existing neighborhood. Compatible. With appeal Compatible. back to this council. Yeah. All right, with you appeal have a, to the council. There's a motion that... And I'll second that. Okay, I have a motion and a second um, related to approving it with the planning department being the go-to group for making sure that it conforms with the area around it. Okay. Okay, do I have further input or questions from council? I just wanted to add that in the end, I think, you know, I, I, I'm in total agreement with the opponents. I, I know what they're looking for and their best interest of their investments in that neighborhood. But Mr. Morris is the one I'm going to hold accountable to because he know, he's hearing everything that's being said. And I know he's going to do the right thing. So uh, bottom line is, hey, we, this, is a, this can be a win-win. Uh, make everybody happy. Make it compatible like we're talking about. But Mr. Morris, please help us out. At the end of the day, it's, you know, it's going to be uh, our vote versus what your uh, actions are after it's all said and done. So that, I just want to throw that in. Okay, Mr. Silvis, Mr. Adams. So my question is to the proponents, are you happy with that motion? Is that motion oh. going to work oh. with you? Is that going to work oh. <coughs> Which to, the, to the opponents? opponents? I'm sorry, opponents. Will we be notified of, of yeah. the progress of this, or, what, or are we just cut out of it no. at this point? Yeah, let the record, Alicia, let the record. There's a. It needs to be on the minutes that there. I've requested or this council. If y'all want to be involved in that, that the council's requested or I, I don't care, that these residents be involved in the process. The it was part of, the, part of the motion that they are involved. That was part of the motion. Alicia, that, uh, part of the motion is that the residents are involved in the process of. What I have is for the But Ms. Farmer made the motion. Let's, let's, there okay. you go. <laughs> okay. Yeah. The motion uh, being that the planning department <laughs> oversee the construction, that it is compatible with the existing neighborhood, and uh, this will have to come back to council for final approval. Is no, not unless no. no not the, way the, okay. come, the way it would come back to council is if Miss Faber sees something that she rejects, and then the pro proponents said we want to take that back to council. Okay, we want to appeal your decision. Take it back to council. I'm I'm fine with not having it come back to council, but I know, and I'll I'll state it so that Miss Faber will keep the council in the loop. As, as working with the neighbors as well as the proponents, the opponents as well. So we need to specify exactly how that will happen. How long? How, how what method? What you need to direct us specifically on what process you would like us to engage. Well, that process residents. being if uh, either proponent or opponent is unhappy with your decisions, they have the right to bring it back to council. So you'd like us to notify for every permit that we receive application for? Yes. Uh, no, no, notify the council. Every permit. Wait, 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 wait. No, no. This permit will be issued all at once, won't it? Well, there'll be a, an individual permit for every structure. And so the way that you've made your motion today, 
before they could get the permit for each individual structure, they would have to bring to us the materials and the sketches and Ms. the Palmer, site layout, and we would have to sign off on that. Make it for the first one. If it meets muster, the rest of them are going to meet muster. Yeah. Don't make it for each. For the first one. That's right. If, if it doesn't meet the, okay. the mark, then But when the you say involve either. the residents, we have to have some mechanism by which to do that because right now that would be an internal administrative process. So if you would prefer us to notify everyone in the area or no. something no. along those lines, we need no. you to tell us that. No. AJ, is there any way at this point, Alicia, as far as I know that we can't require uh, the uh, opponents, proponents to actually come together and, and, uh, and, and be involved in the process, but as, as far as volunteers to come in and perhaps meet and get those views in, I know that you know, we're talking about a win-win situation. But this is my and, and if we could do it on, on a volunteer basis, as far as we could get the input also, uh, would there be an issue with that? If it's not, we're not requiring them to come in and, and, and meet and, and come to a win-win, but we're saying, hey, <laughs> as volunteers, if you're willing to come forward and work with our planning department, we're sure we can come up with something that'll work. It sounds uh, tenable. Okay. I mean, do you mind that I oversee this? As it's my district and my profession, and I, d I, I want to make sure, Mr. Alexander, that it's if it's remanded to staff, it's staff, and okay. you're in a policy job, not there a management right. job. She's and in staff is not in the ability works, of making works, everyone happy. You know, she yeah. works for him, and we oversee him. So let's leave that distinct, but. Um, you know, I'd, I also don't want this to be a vote by committee. We have a planning committee. We have a planning department, and it's their job, and we're giving her plenty of, of guideline that it's supposed to be consistent with the neighborhood. I think, I personally think that it's incumbent on you only to uh, allow folks to come listen, come Absolutely. tell you, here's what I think would be consistent with my neighborhood. I would agree. And, and if they come tell you, here's what I think would be consistent with my neighborhood, you ought to take that into account, and that ought to then move us forward. Agreed. So I don't think you ought to have to have a committee. I don't think you ought, I think that it's now incumbent on the opponents to get with you and say, here's what we think would be consistent with our with our community. Uh, and if you if if they're available, you know, if you make yourself available for them to tell you, here's what we think would be consistent, then you've taken their their uh, consideration. Then you would be uh, listening also to the proponents, and and this thing would take its take its course. So that is my motion, and and I'd like to make the statement that it, since it is Mr. Alexander's district, he certainly, as a council member, has the right to sit in on or oversee sure. or follow up. And right. that he would be the person to do that. No, I don't have any problem there. Okay. I just uh, I want a, the distinction that right. she she's the person that works is the staff person. So, and I I'm always trying to be careful that we're not telling staff right. people what to do because that's not really what our job is. And I'd make so. one more recommendation that you find one of the five uh, appraisers in town that can appraise commercial and residential, and get the opinion at the final is this going to hurt their values. They can appraise. They can look at it and say, "This, this, th the way this we works is going to, or is not going to." No, I think okay. you, you don't. No, we can't choose the appraiser. Okay. I have a motion and I have a second. I think I have clarity for what you're supposed to do, Ms. Faber. So, Ms. Faber. So I'm about I to. I think so. Yeah. Can I'm I ask one more question? And we, it's an hour and a half, an hour and forty-five minutes later. We're into this thing, but uh, the note of the thirty-one mm -hmm. notification that was sent out, uh, and then. The five in favor and zero opposition. I know you read a couple there, but is do we just involve them? I mean, are, I, I don't know if these folks are in that 200-yard radius or I believe whatever everyone it is. that stated their name was in the, in the notification okay. area. I don't remember hearing anyone that was not. Okay, so the 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 26 they were there were zero. There were no response <coughs> and no opposition. Uh, you going to get them involved too, or? I think through this public hearing, they they've been made you. aware they, that they, they can come, come forward. Yeah. yeah. Okay. All right. I have a motion and a second. I'm going to call for the vote. Move the process forward. <laughs> okay. What the motion is is that we we would approve this with the planning department becoming the arbiter of what fits within the neighborhood and requesting that they listen to the opponents and the proponents before they make their decision okay uh, and then if it's appealed it would be by the proponents and it would come back to us all those in favor please say aye aye, aye. aye. any opposed opposed 
Okay, I think you have one, two, three, four, five, six, four, and one against. Okay. So in every other case it comes to us, <coughs> there's a potential of this happening. Well, if it's a con the thing that's interesting here is this isn't normal. Our normal process is about zoning requests. This is about a special, um, a say the right word, a conditional use. use. So we don't see these that often, you Mr. Silvis. Maybe we, one every two or three you know, we years. We normally see because I don't want to put you in a you know burden that we yeah, have no, to do this, this. I think you've this articulated one is, it well. I think this is the right way to do <coughs> this one, but we don't do this very often. Okay. Conditional use is not in front of us all that often. Yeah. Okay, I, I'm going to call for a break and uh, move us back uh, into business after that break. <coughs> 